Hit record here. All right, everyone. It's Dr. Eric, the fitness physician, and another cool episode of the Relentless Vitality Podcast. I'm super excited to have an amazing guest on, Dr. Sean O'Mara. We've been talking for, gosh, almost an hour offline already, and we haven't even hit the record button yet. So we've got a lot to share, and he's got a lot of cool stuff to share with you. He's an amazing gentleman, and um, I think you're going to enjoy this. So Dr. Mara is out there in Minneapolis. And he works with all kinds of people all across the country, business execs, professional performers, and athletes. He does uh, health and performance optimization. That term is probably familiar to you. Um, and he's done a lot of cool stuff, which uh, Dr. Sean, I didn't even realize until I read your bio, you got a, all kinds of interesting background in law enforcement and medical examiners and sheriff's offices and all kinds of cool stuff. So he's got uh, quite the background. But today we're going to talk about what I talk about all the time and what Dr. Sean really talks about is health and performance optimization and getting after that damn visceral fat that I mentioned before. Dr. Sean's a very outspoken proponent, even more than me about it. And he's on a mission to eliminate that damn ugly fat from our guts. So we're going to chat. Hey, Dr. Sean, good to have you on my man. Hey, Eric, super excited to be here with you. And, uh, you know, we just shared how we're both in the same space, health and performance optimizing uh, physicians. And uh, I've been the lone wolf. I've been out there hunting all by myself. And I didn't know there was uh, another wolf out there doing the same thing. So, yeah, super glad that you reached out to me. And I think this is a great space. I think health and performance optimization is the future. I think we're going to find that uh, in time, uh, might be a while, the curriculums of medical schools will start to change and uh, migrate towards real health optimization and which will include performance optimization because that's what we see. I'm sure you see the same thing when you get your clients optimally healthy, they start performing better. And you know, our conventional physician counterparts uh, don't get to see that. They just uh, see people taking more medicines and gradually getting worse. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a discouraging form of a, of, a, of a profession to be involved in. So uh, super glad that you are now a health and performance optimizing physician. Uh, let's kick it, man. I'd really like to see others get involved in it. So glad that your followers are getting to, to learn more from you. And I'm happy to be on your show today. Awesome, man. Thanks. Well, let's uh, tell my listeners, I guess, I guess maybe you could, if you want to talk about how you got into this and let's talk about what health and performance optimization is. And then we'll talk about yeah. our nemesis, that damn visceral fat. So, <laughs> yeah. So like you, I came from an emergency medicine background, and uh, I was uh, a physician who was gradually getting heavier, uh, fat, and uh, I was walking around the, the, my hospital, my ER, drinking a gallon of skim milk with, you know, non-fat skim milk with chocolate syrup in it, and I, I thought I was doing the right thing. I was terrified of fat, and while well, I was getting more fat and more sick, and uh, I met a, a, a patient who was super healthy, and he told me about... Uh, carbohydrates and then the paleo diet. And, and so I cut out carbs and went paleo and uh, all my medical conditions that I had, uh, notwithstanding the fact of my uh, four years of medical school and then four years of residency training and all my research skills, um, I was still getting worse and taking more and more medicines and, and noticed my colleagues had to give me more and more prescriptions. And so uh, it all went away when I changed my diet and my lifestyle. And uh, I had an enlarged prostate, was waking me up four or five times a night. Um, I couldn't get any sleep, and I was only 48. And wow. uh, it would, when I would pee, it would dribble out of me. It would just kind of fall out. I'm like, um, this is like a trickle. This is so pathetic. And I remember being a little kid and being able to shoot it, you know, <laughs> shoot my stream of urine. And I was falling apart. I had back, chronic back pain. I had sleep apnea. I'd snore all night long, keep my wife awake. I'd kick my legs, restless leg syndrome. Um, I had eczema all over my face and my body and scratching and bleeding uh, from that. I had erectile dysfunction, which I don't mind talking about because it's like this hush condition. People, you know, guys don't like to talk about, but that's because they got it. Guess what? I ain't got it no more. I'm happy to talk about that. So <laughs> I bring up podcast and, and uh, I encourage my clients about it. And I also had coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, I was just really falling apart. I had, I had Barrett's esophagus. I was diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus in medical school and it went through the whole med school class. Sean omero has got Barrett's. Sean omero has <laughs> We knew it was a bad thing. And all of those conditions, Eric, reversed. And so I 
I was so overwhelmed that I could get better through lifestyle and not taking any medicines. I got off all my medicines and, uh, you know, my precancerous lesions in my esophagus reversed. And, you know, the metaplastic changes that I was having from biopsies that were, you know, I was having an EGD every three months, uh, it all corrected. So I was compelled. I was overwhelmed. I was like, I have got to become a researcher because I, I couldn't find any explanation in the science. I couldn't find, you know, anything in my, my medical world that explained how this could all happen. And I no longer, you know, had these conditions and I didn't need medicines. So I was compelled to look for, uh, you know, opportunities to become a researcher. So I joined a research practice in Minnesota, um, set up by an MD, PhD uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, C.J. Zeng, and Dr. Zeng was a was a physician, M.D. Ph.D. worked up at uh, University of uh, Washington up in Seattle, uh, studying atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Smart as heck guy. Grew up in China, so he had this thick Chinese accent. Wonderful human being, wonderful researcher, and he was the one that turned me on to visceral fat. So he invited me to come to his practice, research practice. He scanned me, talked to me about visceral fat. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm gonna be so scared if I got this. Because I cut out every bad food. I mean, I was so motivated. I was eating completely clean. And I remember feeling like a little kid. I was so scared, shaking on that scanner. And uh, when they the, they pulled me out of the scanner, the technician, he looked down at me. He goes, you are obscenely healthy. I'll never forget it. And it was really gratifying to, to hear that. And then uh, Dr. Zeng went through my scans and showed me how little visceral fat I had and and how my muscles were good. And, and I, I was a believer. I became a believer in visceral fat. So I joined his practice. And uh, we went on to file for funding from the National Science Foundation and scanned over 6,000 human abdomens, looking at visceral fat, <clears throat> repetitively scanning many of them, trying to study how do you get rid of it. So we did all sorts of innovative uh, uh, studies, you know, looking at walking versus uh, running, running versus sprinting. Uh, fasting, not fasting, all these different techniques to figure out how do you get rid of this visceral fat. So what we found was to the extent that people got rid of visceral fat, Eric, they uh, chronic disease fled their bodies. So mm-hmm. every chronic disease, form of chronic disease that was self-reported in these people either got better or went completely away as they got rid of this visceral fat. Uh, it was so shocking. So now I tell my clients, Whatever medical condition you have, whatever chronic disease you have, just Google it, uh, you know, and and then put comma visceral fat and see there's probably studies that you'll find showing the contribution or the association with visceral fat and then get rid of it. And you'll see your 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 chronic condition will get better. So that was the case. And uh, I, I became a real believer. And then the point I was sharing with you earlier before we hit the record button is the real interesting um, take home uh, observation that I had as a physician uh, eradicating uh, chronic disease by eliminating visceral fat was not only do we get our the patients get healthier, but they performed better. So that was something that just was not part of my experience in medical school. And you agreed, you know, we're just not trained in, in uh, allopathic medicine. You go to medical school. Uh, that when you get rid of disease, people start performing better. Uh, mm-hmm. we, you know, we 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 didn't really talk about getting rid of disease. We talked about treating it. You know, medications and stuff. So it's no wonder that nobody really started performing better. Uh, you're just treating symptoms, kind of suppressing symptoms with you know chemicals and pharmaceutical drugs and things. But yeah, that's my big hope. Um, and here's what I predict: if I could opine about the future. I think one of the big uh, uh, proponents of health and performance optimization is going to be found in corporate America and uh, particularly in self-insured, self-funded large companies of a thousand employees or more because they pay those costs of their uh, health expenses of their employees directly. Uh, They might employ a third party administrator to kind of track the numbers, but they're paying for it. Unlike smaller companies, uh, purchase insurance against that event and pass on those costs 
Um, you know, they just they pay, they pay the cost of insurance. But it's a very different thing if you're paying for the cost of insurance versus if you're paying the bills of your health, your employees health problems. Mm -hmm. So what that means is I see self-insured companies, self-funded companies. And if you're somebody that owns one and you're listening to Eric's show and you hear hear the voice of us talking today, um, get a hold of me, get a hold of Eric. I think Eric's going to get involved in this space. And uh, you should use health influence optimizing strategies to get your employees more healthy. Why? Uh, one, you should care about your employees' health. But two, they're going to perform better. And better performance means increased uh, corporate productivity. Employee productivity means increased revenue of your company. So you guys um, that are for profit, you exist uh, for the purposes of generating uh, revenue. And uh, so that's basically one of part of the uh, the bylaws of a, of a corporation, what their existence is, unless they're in a, a, a charity, is you're in the business to make money. So increased productivity is important. And uh, it's probably the largest untapped area of corporate future corporate growth in America and across the globe is health and performance optimization of employees. So that's what we're, we're doing in my startup. We're we want to be the first real effective company offering health and performance optimization within uh, the corporate space. And we're starting right now with C-levels at the top, working with their leadership, uh, getting their buy-in and using them as examples uh, to influence and be that source of influence. So that's my story. And that's kind of what I'm up to. That is an awesome story, man. I love it. You got me, you got me excited about everything uh, and you're spot on, I think you know, hitting, you know, that's what's important, right? Getting people healthy and making them more productive. And that's kind of one of the messages I speak about when on my, on my videos that I do, I you know, kind of joke that I'm like the I play the Motley Crue, you know, Dr. Feel Good song. It's like, I want my patients to feel good and be, you know, when they're feeling better, their health is better. They're going to be a better spouse, husband, wife, perform better at work, perform better on the track or whatever they're doing. And I think that's an, an awesome, brilliant message you have there about uh, coming at it from that, that perspective. So that's a great story. Um, I love what you do with the the attack on visceral fat. And I really like um, some of the things you talked about. I heard you talk about on another podcast about uh, biomarkers and physical marker signs to follow and track. Cause I, I'm kind of a old school guy myself. And I love like, I remember back in residency learning and reading about like all the old books about the nuances of the history and the physical exam, things that have gotten forgotten and, you know, people just, put everybody through, you know, technology, forget how to do an actual exam on a patient or look, looking what to look for on someone's face or how to interview them and to get, you know, the, the, the everything's in the history, right? We always learned that you can get everything from the history and, and a good physical. Um, so you, I'd love to, you can talk about whatever you want to in terms of biomarkers. I know you talked a little bit about the skin, the face, and, you know, obviously the abdomen, but other things like that. So I think that'd be, and then we could talk a little bit more about visceral fat. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it's interesting, uh, kind of a segue into that. Uh, I noticed that as I became an emergency medicine physician and practiced more, that basically I knew every test that I wanted to order and was going to order uh, within about five minutes of uh, talking to a patient, maybe 10 minutes at the most. And uh, and then I would I had to res actively resist the temptation of just walking out of the room without ever laying hands on a patient. Now, sometimes belly pain, I would lay hands on the pain to kind of figure it out. Um, but me most of the time, I didn't need to touch him. So then then it, I, I just almost, it's laughable, but it's embarrassing. I caught a dog and pony show. I'd have the stethoscope. I'd put it in my ears and I'd put it, and take a deep breath and I'd put a pedantic look on my face. Yeah, one more. You know, as you know, as if I, you know, this physical <laughs> exam was going to, you know, guide what I really do. It was just a dog and pony. Allopathic conventional physicians have gotten away from the skill sets of just paying attention to the human body. Um, our counterparts in 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 Asia and old world countries who don't have the technology and probably I'd call it, you know, the the misleading guidance of big pharma and you know big healthcare that drives us towards revenue. Um, these men and women who, who serve work hard and are brilliant people in their, their, their societies and have studied medicine, help the humans, they get far better results based on their examination skills. So uh, I've been really surprised 
um, with the importance of the appearance of the body and just tracking how the body performs, you know, uh, how it looks. Uh, just I can assess health now just by somebody walking around a shopping mall. Uh, yeah. it's, it's shocking. So the skill sets I have have migrated away from technology and now much more solidly into uh, paying attention to how a body looks, uh, what I can see on a body and and how it performs, you know, walking, running, uh, various different tasks. So, uh, yeah, let's get started. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with your audience uh, this particular image here, if you can hopefully see it. Now I'm going to yep. move my, my body here to uh, the scan. So um, it, if you scan, uh, scan through somebody um, through your abdomen, through the axial plane, Oh, I've never done a podcast where I'm sitting down like this. Kind of interesting. <laughs> That's right. Um, so it produces this unaltered view of a cross section, a slice. So you kind of think of a pizza through the abdomen. And uh, on an MRI, for the sake of your viewers, fat always shows up as white. So we can see white. And by the way, there are different types of fat in the human body. And we, for most of your listening audience, they're going to think of fat as all the same and it's bad and you want to get rid of it. Well, it's really not the case. I mean, I've been surprised. I've come full circle and I have very different attitudes now about fat. There's certain fat you want to get rid of and not have any of. That's visceral fat. And the other type of fat, and we'll show you some examples of the audience, your followers are aware of it, is muscle fat. And it's not fat around the muscle. It is fat deposited in the muscle. And we'll show you pictures of that. And that you, know, you can think of it as human marbling, like steaks get marbled. You do not want your muscle looking like that. Yeah. So a very different thing. And we'll, we'll show you some scans of that. But right now, let's just start with the abdominal uh, region. We'll look at visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. And visceral fat is the white stuff right in the middle. It's the center mass. And if you look there, you can see that this person is more visceral fat than they are anything else. And for the average person, unfortunately, today, that is the case. You know, when you get scanned, uh, people are very surprised how much visceral fat has accumulated inside of them. So uh, this happened to be Dr. Zen's scan, very first time he got scanned. And so we use his example because it's pretty average. The other thing that is to be aware of is the white around the outside in the periphery. That's your subcutaneous fat. So it's sub below cutaneous skin. So it's just below the skin. And it's there for the fat that you can pinch, the pinch the inch, your pinch your pinch the inch type of fat. So in this image here, it's the exact same one as below, but we paint the vis the visceral fat red so we can highlight it and the subcutaneous fat yellow. Kind of throw some caution. You don't want too much subcutaneous fat, but you do want it. And here's the interesting thing. We'll get into it. Your subcutaneous fat is protective of uh, uh, outcome. It improves your mortality and, uh, and it improves outcome. If you don't have subcutaneous fat and you have more visceral fat, you'd be better off accumulating some subcutaneous fat to kind of offset that visceral fat. Now, a big difference between these two depots is one is metabolically active. So visceral fat is metabolically active, and it's secreting inflammatory substances 24 hours a day, causing inflammation all over. But subcutaneous fat is not metabolically active except for a certain kind, and that's one specific region, um, your, your deep subcutaneous fat. And you can see it on MRIs. Um, I don't know if it shows up here. It's pretty poor in this image here, but there's a black line right here along this in the subcutaneous region here. Uh, you can just barely make it out and barely make it out there. Yep. So sub superficial subcu fat is the closest skin. The deep subcutaneous fat is the deep part. Now, we almost always see deep subcutaneous fat in the region of the love handles. So if you're a guy or you're a woman and you hate love handles, it's a reason. It's bad news to have love handles. It means you got deep subcutaneous fat and that stuff is, is metabolically active. And I have yet to see deep subcutaneous fat in a human being that doesn't also have a lot of visceral fat. 
So a really cool, interesting way to tell if you've got visceral fat is if you've got love handles. If you've got love handles, you got visceral fat. And it's it's re a really interesting thing. And you can still have it without deep subcutaneous fat, but there's a certain threshold when you reach, when you start putting on um, uh, the love handles, you really got a lot of uh, subcutaneous fat. So we'll get, in, we'll get into those pictures. So let's look at, you know, for the sake of your audience, what's a good amount of visceral fat? And what's a bad, you know, what's a good abdominal MRI scan? What's a bad one? Because this is important. If you go on to get an MRI scan, if you're listening and you manage to get your primary care doctor to get an abdominal MRI scan on you or a CT of your abdomen, um, they're not going to be able to read it. It's not read by radiologists because it's not trained by them. So when you hear this story, when you hear this podcast, and you jump in Google and you start reading about this stuff called visceral fat that you never heard about until you start following uh, Prime X here on their podcast, uh, you're going to get alarmed about it and no doctor will be able to help you out. So you, you're you going to have to read your own scan unless you get to Eric or myself. And uh, I'm super excited Eric is now in this space and concerned about visceral fat. So you got to know what's good and bad. And so good is my friend up here. Um, he's Gabe uh, in the Army National Guard with me. And uh, Gabe uh, has very little white stuff in the middle up here. Very, very small. He's got this nice oval-shaped abdomen. He's got his muscles. Muscles on an MRI scan show up as dark. Look how big uh, Gabe's muscles are. These big circles here, that's Gabe's core. He, you know, Gabe works out, does calisthenics, does gymnastics, and he's got a big core. He's invested in his body. Dude's jacked, and, and he's put a lot of effort in and eats clean, carnivore. So very, very healthy compared to... Uh, another friend that I have here um, who's filled with visceral fat inside. And this friend uh, is, is about the same age as Gabe and huge amount of visceral fat. And look how small his muscles are. So one of the problems of visceral fat is it, its contribution to chronic disease and in particular to sarcopenia. And sarcopenia is a great concern because it's a scourge afflicting humans, particularly as we age, where you lose muscle mass. But you not only lose muscle mass, but you lose muscle performance. So your muscles don't perform as well. We pick up on it in strength, but you'll find out in some other slides here that it's not just strength. It's muscles perform, help you stand tall, look good, and just basically lift. So it's more than just lifting weights. So big take-home lesson is the more visceral fat you have, the more your muscles shrivel up and go away and you cannot perform as well. And so we'll get into examples of that. Let's look at now a second biomarker, which I alluded to in the beginning. This biomarker is fatty infiltration or fat being deposited within the skeletal muscles, okay? So you think your arms, your legs, your chest muscles, your pectoralis majors, you know, uh, young guys, if you're listening and you got nice pecs, if you wonder why the meatheads, they're still trying to lift weights that are 50, 60 years old and their, their pecs are now sagging, it's because of this. And they don't even know it because all their career, they've been building muscle, using carbs and didn't know that they were building up visceral fat and then fat deposited in their muscles. So you be smarter and you pay attention and you get yourself scanned and you'll see, oh my God, I got this too. And I, I'm going to listen to uh, Dr. Sean and Dr. Eric, and I'm going to get rid of my visceral fat. And I do not want fat in my muscles, causing my muscles to shrivel up and sag. So I look, you know, I can't perform well and I look bad when I'm in my fifties and sixties. So what does this fat look like in the muscle? See the white streaks in this muscle? That looks like a like a steak that might be served in some kind of fancy steakhouse where they, you know, well, sir, this steak has got right. a very hard <laughs> level of beautiful marbling in it. Here's how Dr. Sean trains say, like, well, sir, I'm bringing to your table right now a very ill, infirm, and sick animal, piece of their flesh. This cow was poorly trained. It was given a lot of carbohydrates. It is sick as Hades. And would you like to eat it? 
<laughs> no, you don't want to eat that. You don't want, and you, by the way, you don't want to be that animal either. That's you do not want to have these fatty white streaks marbleizing your muscle so it's shriveling up and weak. What do you want to have? Uh, my boy right here, this guy. This, th these are the legs of an Olympic sprinter. His name, if you're on Instagram, is <clears throat> at Matadi, Emmanuel Matadi, uh, M-A-T-A-D-I. So Emmanuel Matadi is an awesome human being, an awesome sprinter. <laughs> these are his legs. He doesn't have those fatty infiltrates. And uh, now let's look at correlation. Why does it happen? Well, we picked up over the course of seven years studying people from the National Science Foundation the dumb ER doctor, I always call myself a dumb ER doctor because that's what our colleagues think of us as, you know, the former ER physicians, they, you right. know, anybody uh, outside of emergency medicine think ER, ER doctors are dumb. <laughs> all right, so the dumb ER doctor noticed and all of the patients that were scanning doing MRIs on, ones that were filled with visceral fat in their abdomen, they had the most fatty infiltrates in the legs. If you're a doctor and you're listening to this right now, how come you've never seen this correlation between visceral fat and all these fatty infiltrates in your legs? You, you know, orthopedic doctors, radiologists, they're reading this stuff and they ignore it. They're not even picking up on it. My, my best friend's an orthopedic surgeon. He didn't pay attention to this. So these fatty streaks are going to be in humans that have a lot of visceral fat, and they're not going to be in their, in their skeletal muscle if they don't have a lot of visceral fat. So that's a big take-home point biomarkers, visceral fat, and then fatty infiltrate in the legs. Let me bring up another interesting point about these fatty infiltrates in the legs. Only in the past month, AI, you know, AI is all the big talk. AI has figured out that if you have those fatty infiltrates in your legs, doubles your risk of morta mortality, meaning for dying from cardiovascular disease, doubles it. Yeah. That's amazing. Huh? And it's being ignored. Yeah, nobody's talking Here's the about other it. Thing. It took AI all these years. Now I know AI is kind of a new thing, but it took until you know just a month ago to figure this out. We found this out seven years ago just by tracking. Look at all the old people, diseased people, um, really obese people with a lot of visceral fat have these white streaks in their muscles. So we knew it was a bad thing, but you know, there wasn't studies being done on. I just can't I can't sleep at night because I can't I can't figure out how this is so abundant and nobody's <laughs> picking up on it. Yeah, but anyway, it all performance optimizing physicians, we're aware of it now. And that's why you want to go to Dr. Eric, come to me, somebody else in this space to get rid of these fatty infiltrates in your legs and get rid of visceral fat. So that's a really important biomarker. And here's what it, it looks like you've seen in the grocery store, and you want to be this sick, okay. You want to be this nice, healthy animal um, and not this animal that's filled with grass-fed, uh, uh, this animal that's filled with all these fatty infiltrates. The grass-fed one doesn't have it. The one that's fed carbohydrates, corn, soy, uh, uh, grains, um, uh, even molasses, they feed these cows to fatten them up and get more of these streaks. Now, here's an interesting thing. I just got a new client who's a veterinarian. And uh, this veterinarian is coming in because he wants to optimize his health. And I take care of humans. He takes care of animals. So we had this very interesting conversation just a month ago. And do you know what he told me? These cows make him all the money. He only gets called for cows that are fed grain. He <laughs> never gets called for the ones eating grass that are eating a species-specific diet. Wow. Imagine that. The wow. whole cattle industry, veterinarians only make money off of grain-fed cows. Now, why haven't physicians, human physicians, figured that out? That the patients that don't have this, don't have visceral fat, you know, uh, don't have any medical problems. It's because they also don't make any money off of it. So if you're listening today, the system doesn't want you to know about what uh, Prime X is bringing today in this podcast, which is what you eat plays a huge role in, in how healthy you are. So um, you you really want to pay you really want to pay attention to your diet and and what you're eating. Boy, my uh, my screen popped off there. Uh, my greatest fear, you know, not being a uh, uh, a techie. Is it showing up? Okay, good. So <laughs> yeah, so you you want to be aware of that. So I show these examples 
of uh, these steaks and uh, and and what happens to animals happens to human beings just uh, uh, just in a in a, in in different species. All right, so let's look at some MRIs of legs. Here's one uh, legs for a 47 year old, so an average 47 year old uh, here, pretty healthy uh, athlete, doesn't have those streaks. And then let's look at two 74 year olds now. If you're looking at these scans, you've never been to medical school, you can see very big difference between these two right away. And you haven't even been to medical school. It might be the first MRI you've ever seen, but you can see that. And what's happened here is, oh boy, this person's leg is mostly fat. And their muscles are small compared to these muscles and these muscles. But the guy right here is 74, same age as this one, but they're vastly different. So that infiltrating fat is destroying that muscle there. And this person may not even pick up on the fact that their muscles are going away because they have so much subcutaneous fat too much that they end up um, basically thinking their legs are the same size it was in high school, but they're not. They're shrinking away the good stuff. You want more muscle and less fat. So that's the take home point to, to be aware of. And the other interesting thing is um, the, I don't know if I, how, how much it shows up. Maybe if I blow it up, um, I might be able to, to, to capture. Uh, but in that in that top image, if you see the black there, um, it's pretty thin. You know, it's very thin. And that's the bony cortex. So as you eat a high carbohydrate diet and you have a lot of visceral fat, it erodes your bones, and you get osteoporosis and osteopenia. But look how much thicker you know, this person's bones are because um, they don't have those fatty infiltrates. They don't have that visceral fat that's causing um, thinning of the bone. So, you know, that's a big problem. You know, us ER guys would take care of, you know, those uh, LOL squares that would come in our ER, hip fractures laying on, on the floor for days, and uh, nobody would even know about them, you know. So, and the high mortality, if you don't know, um, you know, 90% of people um, are dead if they're 85 years of age within one year if they fracture their hip. Mm -hmm. 85 years of age, you fracture your hip, you got a 90% chance of dying over the next year because of the uh, increased mortality uh, from that particular event. So you want to have healthy, and it probably is, it, it's really not the bone. I mean, I could go and fracture if I was kind of crazy maniacal person and fractured their leg with a big sledgehammer. Um, it's not really that particular event. It's the fact that if they had that, they got a thin bone and they got fatty infiltrates in their muscles and they got all that visceral fat, means that their overall health has declined that much that they just can't recover. They just spiral down. They're no longer vigorous and vital. So don't think it's, you know, you can walk around and like put braces on your leg. And if I always got to do is keep from breaking your leg. No, it's the, it's the causation underlying that fracture, the poor lifestyle that causes all this disease within you. So your take home lesson is I don't want visceral fat and I don't want that, those fatty infiltrates in my muscles. So if now look at this image, you haven't been in medical school. That's a lot of white there. Hopefully your followers now are, are, are watching and say, my God, uh, that's a lot of visceral fat. And this guy really had a lot of visceral fat. And uh, his muscles are very small, you know, little, little tiny muscles. And this guy came into my clinic um, to have this done. And um, uh, he, he thought he was really healthy. He could just pinch an inch. And if you look at the fat around his outside, the sub-Q fat, it's just a small amount. So he's a topi. He's thin outside, excuse me, thin outside, and he's fat inside. So Tophies have increased mortality. And um, he also looked awful. His face was so inflamed looking. that when I was talking to him, Eric, um, I was stuttering. And if you haven't picked up, Sean loves his job. He loves this space. And so when clients come to, to deal with me, I'm a happy camper, happy clam. I love to talk to people about this, but this guy walked in and I took one look at his face. I started stuttering and then I was fascinated. I'm stuttering. I'm like, I'm not really enjoying talking to this guy. And I'm like, why, why am I not enjoying this? Cause I'm afraid. 
And I said, what am I afraid of? I said, why am I afraid of this guy? I said, I finally realized I'm not afraid of him. I'm afraid that he's going to have a heart attack in front of me any minute. This guy looks that bad. He looks horrible. And so when I showed him my scan, I, I showed good scans and bad scans, what a good abdomen looks like, what a bad abdomen was. And in a very short period of time, this guy got it. Like we're talking minutes. Yes. The same thing. Basically, I showed you and your followers just now. It's about, you know, 10 minutes we've been talking. Then I opened up his scan. And because he had had that 10 minute little primer like your followers just had, when he saw his scan, this guy literally passed out in front of me. Did he really? Hit the ground. Uh, <laughs> wow. And, and uh, before he turned, uh, it was very interesting because. Before he passed out, he turned green like a brand new second lieutenant smoking a cigar in the officer's mess. He turned green and he stayed green for like three seconds. He's standing up when I was showing. I never let clients stand up anymore when I show them their scans. No. And then three seconds of green was followed by three seconds of gray. He turned gray, literally like gray paint, like a metallic gray paint. And I was like, my God, this man's a human chameleon. I couldn't hardly talk. I'm trying to explain his scan for him. I'm so distracted by the coloration change in his face that I could barely get the words out. And the next thing I know was he went from gray to ischemic white, you know, like somebody goes VTAC in front of you. I'm like, oh, boy, lack of perfusion. This guy is going down. And I went running to try to catch him. You know, it was like impending syncope. Never made it. He was on the other side of the table. Oh knocks gosh. over two chairs. <laughs> Nurses come running over. Uh, and now the sudden thought comes in. I'm so pissed off at myself because I'm saying, oh, my God, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. He is having a heart attack. And you idiot, you don't even have a crash cart in your little wellness clinic. You have no epinephrine. You don't even have an AED defibrillator. All you're going to do in this guy is thump on his chest. Hold on, one, so, one. <laughs> it was it was horrible. Uh, I immediately checked for a pulse. He had a pulse, so he was, he, you know, I, I didn't have to thump on his chest. Didn't have to do compressions. He came to and then went through all my, you know, classic questions I have for ischemia, try to figure out what's going on. And it was just a vasovagal event induced by insight and awareness that this guy was not as healthy as he thought he was. He was profoundly unhealthy, and he knew that within minutes of this. So completely changed. So. I tell this story because it's necessary for people to be aware and physicians to be aware that you have got to show people disease. you got to make them aware. You can't talk about disease in a report. You have to sensorily process it through your senses to understand how bad it is. So um, that's why I, I include that now in my story. And then another example is uh, a marathon. OK, so this guy was a friend of mine, um, still is a friend today. He, he was running eight to 10 marathons a year, very wow. competitive distance runner. And you can see the yellow is very thin around his body. Okay, so very low amount of subcutaneous fat, but look at all the red inside of him. So he too is a topi, thin outside, fat inside, thin yellow streak of ribbon fat, subcutaneous fat around him, and a lot of red stuff in the middle. Okay, so we scanned him, we showed it to him, and then he got really mad and he, you know, came up to me, got very close and said, I am going to be your most motivated client. So his scan motivated him to walk from distance running, which is a really hard thing to do. If you ever did distance running and know anybody who distance runs, they don't quit very easily. You know, you get all those endorphins that get released, becomes habitual. And I'm a former distance runner. And uh, it was it, it was very hard for me to migrate from distance running, but I gave it up and this guy gave it up. And now he's just a sprinter today. And that's what we get all our clients uh, to do is to sprint. So let's talk about what causes visceral fat. So what if you're listening right now and you're like, God, I wish this dude, you know, Eric has on would tell me how to get rid of this stuff. I get it's bad. OK, let's let's talk about what causes it. All right. So. In this particular scan for the National Science Foundation, we found out it was carbohydrates, specifically processed carbohydrates, simple carbs, processed foods. What's that? Bread, pasta, rice, chips, soda, ice cream, candies, energy bars, health bars, 
you know, anything that basically is like tasty in a processed form, that's what's causing visceral fat. So how do we know that? Because we would do scans, in this case, a series of scans on people where we'd eliminate. We'd ask the question, what happens when they stop eating uh, processed foods and carbohydrates? Let's take a look. Well, this scan shows it. This first one, is, this guy's filled with red, lots of red up here. And then over the course of 35 weeks, look how much red reduction he has. He's reduced his visceral fat that much. And he goes from having a dad bod <clears throat> up here um, where his belly is sticking out to having an oval shape abdomen, like a 20 something collegiate swimmer. This guy with the dad bod is 68 years old, so almost 70. And wow. then he gets this nice oval shape at the age of 70 because he listened to us and cut out those carbohydrates. But the interesting thing was he didn't exercise one minute. And I was, I was mad that he didn't because I was like, dude, you're violating the protocol, the National Science Foundation protocols. You got you to exercise with this. But I'm glad he was a curmudgeon, refused to do it because it eliminated, you know, the question is, well, was it the exercise or was it the processed foods? Now we know for darn sure it's the processed foods. Yeah. This scan, this picture, this slide needs to be in every health grade class in America, in every school room. And it needs to be in every physician's office so that they can explain to patients why they got to stop eating this crap and just eat clean. And it should be in every medical school so that it's part of the curriculum. And it's not right now. So anyway, that's that's what I'm trying to do. And that's your first lesson. Cut out ca carbohydrates, processed foods. Now, how about exercise? I mentioned runner running. Um, seem to cause in that one runner a lot of visceral fat. So what we've come to see is it probably doesn't cause visceral fat as much as it makes it resistant to elimination. So there's something about visceral fat that it hangs around more in distance runners and accumulates more in distance runners um, and, and not in sprinters. So you remember uh, Matadi, M-A-T-A-D-I, on Instagram, he had no visceral fat in his abdomen and no fat in his legs because, um, you know, he he was an Olympic sprinter. So and he also ate clean back then. I'm not sure what Matadi's eating these days. Um, uh, I'm kind of half afraid to ask him where I'm, I'm going to be scanning, scanning him. So he better tell me the truth. He might see this video. Um, so here here's a, a CEO of a company who's 58 years old. And you can see that he's got a lot of visceral fat, the white in there. And uh, the thing is, this is a repeat scan. So he's supposed to be coming back and he should be better because he's supposed to be following our protocols. And he wasn't any better. And so that's very bad. In fact, this is the only time it happened. It was like you, you bring this person back and they haven't scanned. And uh, he was the only one that didn't get better. So I'm like, what in the world are you cheating? Are, are you eating bread? Are you, you eating ice cream and pasta and you know, rice and stuff. And he said, no, I'm not. And I said, why? How about alcohol? Are you drinking? And he said, no, I'm not drinking. You know, uh, I said, how about poor sleep? Are you not sleeping? Nope. Sleeping great. And then I well, what about stress? You know, you got a lot of stress, you know, having a problem with a kid at home or, you know, problems at work or you're with your wife or something. Nope. Everything's going good. So I spent a lot of time tracking through all those. So the next question I had said, are you running? You were a runner. Are you still running? And this guy was running 10 miles a day, five days a week. Wow. And he still was running. He admitted he didn't stop running. I'm like, look, dude, the protocol is you got to stop running. And you got to sprint. And unless you do that, uh, the free show is over. You're not getting any more free MRIs. No more time with doctors. We're going to eliminate you from the study. So he agreed. All right. I'm going to. I'm going to go back to sprinting. I'm going to cut out the distance running. This guy just actually <clears throat> contacted me last night. So uh, it's funny. <laughs> since he's coming up. So anyway, he, he did that. And look what happened. So he goes from all this visceral fat uh, to no visceral fat. And he looks like he, he got a six pack. I mean, he built muscles just by stopping running and proved his ability to build muscle. And if you think about it, like, how is that possible? Well, Marathoners, what do they look like? After they've been doing marathons for 30 years, are they jacked? Do they're they have thin. a lot of muscle? No. They're emaciated and thin, little tiny arms. I don't know why people 
want to embrace running. You know, they say, well, it's good for your health. And they, I, it's not, it has been shown in, 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 at least anecdotally in our studies, it just shrinks muscle and then causes them to hold on to visceral fat. And, and uh, so there's increasing evidence, long-term studies about atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, being associated with distance running. So I get all my clients to stop distance running and to do what's healthy, getting sprinting. And this is a big example of it. And we see this time and time again, when people would embrace sprinting, give up distance running, they get better. All right, so you remember this slide, okay? This is a really bad abdomen. This is a really good abdomen, you know, Matadis. And uh, the legs are really good and legs are really bad. Let's look at these people, you know, so they're example. There's my boy, Matadi, the Olympic sprinter, sprinter. Now, this is him probably eight years ago. And look at all his massive muscles. So the reason why I got him in there is he didn't lift weights and wasn't doing push-ups and pull-ups. This guy was a one-trick pony. He only sprinted. And he put on musculature like that. So sprinting is fantastic for building muscles. And it's been shown through um, uh, laboratory analysis, it produces myokines and the largest <clears throat> amount of molecule, um, messaging molecule out there is LACFI, combination of lactate and phenylalanine. <clears throat> the LACFI gets created the most in 10 exercises study. The highest one that produced the most LACFI <clears throat> was sprinting. The second highest was resistance training, lifting weights. What was at the very bottom of the 10 exercises? Distance running. So you, if you want to build muscle, you want to be really healthy, you want to sprint. Well, let's look at the guy with the bad abdomen, with all the fat infiltrates. Look at his big dad bod, okay? This was him when he came to me. Then he followed the, national, the protocol that we developed from the National Science Foundation and many others that I've added to it since that time. And he goes from here to here in five months. So it's a big change. Uh, in his appearance and in his visceral fat levels shrunk considerably. Now, if you remember the guy who cut out the processed foods and wouldn't do exercising for one minute, the curmudgeon, the 68-year-old guy, this is your third biomarker, which is fat around the heart. You can call it heart fat, cardio fat, pericardial fat, um, a combination of pericardial fat and epicardial fat, but it's fat around the heart. Highly inflammatory, it causes its most effect is directly on the arteries that it's in approximation with. It's touching those <clears throat> surrounding the arteries of the heart, which are on the outside. Now in 13 weeks, just cutting out processed foods dramatically reduced his heart fat, which is just that amount. So big, huge change for cutting out processed foods. We're not taught this in medical school. We don't share it with, with patients, but if you're worried about having a heart attack, you wanna get rid of your visceral fat, you wanna cut out eating processed foods so you can have that kind of a beneficial change in the interim. Now, this is my most uh, exciting slide, best scan that we did, it's my favorite scan, and it is um, scan of arteries in the brain. So um, I, I personally feel that strokes are probably the cruelest form of pathology that we would treat in the ER. Uh, and the reason is, I don't know what your experience was like, but you know, somebody would, you know, we'd get the calls from the paramedics, uh, code stroke coming in, cute stroke. We'd we call it. We'd be all, you know, everybody be ready for it. And uh, they'd come in. The stroke patient would be laser locked with big, huge eyes looking right at me. Why? Because I'm the dude with the long white coat. They're not really interested in the other people. They're looking for the doctor because they know they can't talk. They can't walk. They can't move. And it's the most terrifying thing they've ever been through in their entire life. So they're laser locked looking right at you, right? That's the ER position. And you're trying to help them out. <clears throat> and then uh, that's, maybe you get TPA in them. Uh, maybe it's too late. You know, uh, maybe it doesn't work. <clears throat> so six months later, 18 months later, 12 months later, they come back in. That same one. Haven't had any more strokes. Uh, nothing different, you know, about their, their stroke pathology. This time, they won't even look at you. That head's laying down on the pillow. They want to make eye contact. Why are they there? Because now they got a fever. It's there in the middle of the night, and they're coming in from some nursing home, and they're septic, and they're sick, and they're coming in. And uh, those those eyes won't even look at it. Why? Because they've already resigned themselves to the fact that they'll never get better. They're never going to talk. 
they'll never understand the speech of a loved one coming in town that, um, you know, dad, we love you. Mom, we love you. Uh, they're never getting out of the diapers that they wear. So they know that they will never change. Their fate is sealed. But if you're listening today uh, and you haven't had a stroke yet, your fate is not sealed, provided you find out how to live. And you're not going to hear that from your primary care doctor. You're not going to figure out how to live properly to optimize your health and keep this from happening. They'll give you partial recommendations. They'll tell you like lowering cholesterol, you know, but that that's associated with increased mortality. But you want to go to a health optimizing physician that knows about visceral fat, get rid of that so you can dramatically reduce your risk of heart attacks and strokes. And don't take my word for it. Jump on Google, read visceral fat, comma, heart attacks, visceral fat, comma, strokes, visceral fat, comma, cancer, all the big killers and read how it's associated. So in this particular scan here, this is a, um, a patient who came in. And we saved him. Uh, who He was on the verge of having a stroke. Why? Because he came in this image here. And you see that white circle? These are arteries. That's a big blockage in that artery. That's a middle cerebral artery, which, you know, us ER doctors, <laughs> we would see it. We'd see it reported. Um, I could just barely remember from med school that it was the metal, middle cerebral artery is the most common site for a stroke. I never really paid attention to it in the air. It didn't really matter where it was. It was TPA and get them in neurology, get them admitted. You know, <laughs> who cares where it was? But now I pay attention to it because I, I look for it in advance. So I look for these lesions as a dumb ER doctor, now a health and performance optimized physician. I look for these lesions to tell these people, dude, you better change your life before you stroke out and it's diapers for you for the rest of your life. Your wife is going to be going to Costco, buying the big cases, and it's not going to be good to do something about it. So this big lesion also, you can see in this uh, artery up here on the other side, diminished blood flow. So you get atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it impedes the arterial flow, and so these, these arteries get clogged up. And so that's what you, you, we, we watch for in these scans. And then what do we do? We get, we use lifestyle changes. We get people to change their diet, eliminate, eliminate carbohydrates. I recommend eating a carnivore diet. Get started on ultimate. It's a zero carb diet. Start, start going zero carb. You can always roll back in if you want to, but if you've got a big gut and it's sticking out, you, you're going to want to go on a, on a, a, a zero carb diet and, uh, and save yourself. And the other interesting thing, it won't show up in here in this scanner, is when we started opening up these arteries and we scanned them, we saw these clogs that were opening up. A very interesting thing happened to me and, and then happened to my clients in our study. They got visible pulses. So now you don't go feel a pulse. You just go and look at that pulse. It's fantastic. So these arteries were opening up and visible pulses were being produced throughout the body. And the other cool thing about having visible pulses besides I think it's kind of a badass thing. You go to a party trick and say, can you see your pulses? I see mine. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a funny thing to be able to do, but here's a really cool benefit. I can uh, go into my sauna and I will watch the incredible blood flow open up. Now I'm not talking heart rate. Boom, 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 boom. I don't care about that. I mean, dying, you know, patients filled with chronic disease have fast heart rates. What I care about is increasing blood flow. Increased blood flow to tissues, it gets better. People think better. Their memory impairment reverses. So you want a little mark? You're meant to be biologically with this gauge on your body, be able to see visible pulses that get massive. You know, we're talking, it's still slow, but it's like <laughs> exploding the Basically, what is the magnitude of that lumen expansion? So average people, if you could see the artery, it's expanding like this. Well, when you go into a sauna through nitric oxide production, if you're really healthy, instead of just going like this, it's going like this. All right. Now we, we can see that through the skin, visible pulse. And you can also see it when you do some other things. Maximum intensity exercise, sprinting more than jogging. Sprinting produces more increase in that blood flow, probably because it enhanced 
nitric oxide production from sprinting. And the, the third one that you, you get it from is uh, when you uh, go out in sunshine. So when you go out in sunshine, it also produces uh, nitric oxide. And I see my pulses, you know, get increased the magnitude of my pulses. And the fourth one I figured out is fasting. So when you're doing it, especially an extended fasting, I'm not talking like, oh, I do intermittent fasting and I, I eat 16 hours a day and then I fast for eight hours a day. You're not going to get nitric oxide, significant nitric oxide production to see increased magnitude of your, your artery. You're on your, your, your step. But that's sort of like saying, um, oh, I'm, I'm starting my educational career and I'm just going to simply take math from first grade on and nothing else. And then I'll be educated at the end. When it comes to health optimization, it is many, many things, not just one thing. Oh, I just cut out bread and I'm going to be healthy. Good luck with really preventing that stroke. Yeah, it's a start, but you gotta do a lot more to open up arteries and be optimally healthy. So those four examples, I'm right down for you here for your followers. Maximum intensity exercise, sprinting, the sauna, extended fasting, and sunshine. I call my visible pulses my dashboard. It's my visible dashboard. I When I do those things, I glance down like when I'm driving a car, I check out how's the operation of the vehicle. You know, I don't know how to read an RPM meter. <laughs> Attack. I'm, I'm not that good of a driver. But I look at the speedometer, okay? Now, if I was a really cool, you know, good. I might look at my tack meter, my RPMs or whatever, you know, to, to increase performance. But I am a, not just a good health performance optimizing physician, I'm a great health and performance optimizing physician. So I'm looking at my biological dashboard, my pulses when I go out and do things. And it tells me sun is good. I want to be out in the sun. And, uh, you know, the dermatologist in high in med school, high school, med, my, might as well have been high school. <laughs> Um, the dermatologist got me terrified that sun, tan skin is damaged skin. You know, all this stuff like, you know, exposure to sun is really damaging. Well, exposure to my sun, when I go out there, optimizes my blood flow. And uh, so that's how I, I, I've really improved myself. So anyway, real quick, let's get, because we're running out of time here, the dad bot. Okay, let me address this issue. This dad bot is nothing to take um, for granted. The dad bod is nothing more than weakness, okay? It's diseased muscles. What's really going on? That abdomen can't hold the guts in anymore. So here's what I found out. You could remove all that visceral fat, remove it, and that, that, that dad bod is still going to be there. All the guts are going to stick out because the muscles have been weakened <clears throat> by the influence from all the inflammatory substances that visceral fat produces over the years. And it degrades that dad bod. So this is a colleague of mine, Alex. He's got a small dad bod, and I warned him about it. Here's another client of mine who came in, big abdomen, reversed his visceral fat. And in five months, um, he's improved his abdomen, getting a lot flatter. And then this was his MRI scans, how much he improved in three months. Sorry, it wasn't five months. That was three months. The That's guy awesome. changed it. Three That's months. So track these MRIs, you see that visceral fat being eliminated and his heart fat, how much it was eliminated at the same time, three months uh, repeating those scans and that's his face. And then look how much my face has changed. Wow, and that's a huge so, difference. So uh, I had a niece who uh, saw one of my podcasts and she goes, that's not Dr. Sean. He, I mean, that's not Uncle Sean. Uncle Sean never looked like that. Oh, I did. Just my niece just couldn't believe that I look like it. It does look like different people, but that's from the influence of visceral fat. Um, and then this is the change in my face over a period of time. So I started putting on a visceral fat. And right about this point is when I found out about visceral fat and I started eliminating it. So then my face gets leaner, more lean, and still more lean here. Well, if you're listening as well, it's because you lost fat. No. It's because I lost certain type of fat, visceral fat. It's not my weight. I weigh 165 here. Here, I weigh 178. Put on 13 pounds. Put on muscle, got rid of, of damaging inflammatory fat. 
that's how my face changed that much. So that's, that's what's really going on. And then here's another client, another feature that goes on is that sometimes people, visceral fat will cause a, a inflammation of their nose. So look how big inflamed this guy's nose here. And right. then in less than a year, he's reduced his inflammation in his face and reduced that, um, that nasal inflammation. So here's another uh, facial photograph. Here's a, a very pretty girl on Sports Illustrated. She's got a pretty effeminate face. But what's really shocking is I did this on purpose. Look at her body. <laughs> so what's going on there? How did she get a pretty face and she's got a big body? Sub-Q fat. She has very low visceral fat, but a lot of subcutaneous fat. So women who are premenopausal have more sub-Q fat and less visceral fat. And so they can maintain their pretty faces. But good luck staying pretty when menopause kicks in. And you don't know anything about visceral fat. Your face is going to get inflamed looking, old, saggy, unattractive, and you're going to hate it. And if you don't believe that that's, that's going to happen to you, I want you to go out and pull your relatives photographs out. And look at all your grandmas and, and, and uh, your, your aunts and look at their faces before they hit menopause and what happens to them afterwards. And the way to keep this from happening is get rid of your visceral fat and learn what you got to do by going to health and performance optimized physician so you get rid of that visceral fat. Look at this young lady's face, Sinead O'Connor. Mm, wow. Look at her today. Wow, I nobody have not seen that picture. That's a huge difference. Yeah, nobody told poor Sinead about this. All that money she made, and look what happened to her. Is that going to happen to you? If you're listening today, you're a young lady or a man, uh, what's visceral fat going to do to you? Uh, are you going to have a face that improves and a body that improves? Or are you going to have a face and body that worsens? So um, let me just, uh, here's another picture of my face again. Another example, just the profound changes when you get rid of that visceral fat. Visceral fat. <clears throat> my legs, I got a lot hairier. So my legs here, about 300% increase in my hair. So um, I think you can actually increase hair on the head, but I, I don't have a densometer to measure hair on my hair. Uh, a hair in my head, but I have no bald spot. I don't know if it shows on my camera, but I, I don't have any hair. And if you if you go to a church, that's where you go. I go see old people in the church because they're not shopping malls anymore because they're they're too diseased. They can't walk around. But they somehow manage to get in churches with their walkers and stuff. And I look at the back of the church and I see all the bald heads. And then when I'm going forward uh, in church to uh, get up either a seat or going for communion or whatever. Um, I, I, I look at these people and the ones with bald heads, bellies. And the ones that don't have any bald heads, flat abdomens. How come that's not taught in medical school? Interesting correlation. All that baldness. If you're, if you're struggling with hair thinning out, uh, you better pay attention to these slides. Visceral fat and fatty infiltration and good choices about how you live your life. You know, it's really not a, not not just by a coincidence. All right, let's get back to those muscles, okay? That dad bod, because look look what happened to me. I'm going to try to blow that up. Uh, let me see if I can probably, whoop. I don't think I can blow it up, but right. my ass in here is sticking out here. If hopefully you're, you, that shows up in the scan. Yeah, um, I can that abdomen is, is, is sticking out. And my abdomen is flat here. Well, the difference between here and here is um, I went carnivore, but the big, you know, the, the big difference is like, you might think, well, I got a lot of visceral fat in there. Well, let's look at how, what my, my scan looked like. I didn't have any visceral fat then. So why was my st stomach sticking out? It was because for uh, 50 two years before I had a lot of visceral fat and it literally destroyed my muscles, my fascia and my, my beautiful abdomen's ability to hold my guts in. And if you've got a little pooch in your abdomen, it's because of the effect of visceral fat chemically and not mechanically. People think it's visceral fat pushing out. No, it is really the biochemical influence of that inflammatory crap inside of you, destroying your muscles. Let's go back to the picture. It's not just your abdomen. 
It's all your muscles. Mm -hmm. Look at my arms. I got lunch lady arms, soft little kind of feminine, you know, lunch lady arms. And the other, other aspect to this is what happens when the muscles stop, stop working? You, you think it's not just strength that we measure in sarcopenia. They don't hold you up anymore. Mm -hmm. What's the defining kind of a physique of an old person? They're hunched over like this. Yep. You know, crooked. They're, they're hunched over. They can't straighten up anymore. Those poor little old ladies with, that are trying to talk to you with their head up like this. You know, it's because their muscles can't uh, keep their spine and their skeletal system upright. So it's from visceral fat destroying the performance and the per, per, uh, productivity of those muscles. So when I got rid of my visceral fat, I could actually start to optimize and re recover my muscles. And now I stand up tall and look straight. And look at even the shape of my head has changed. I don't know how that's possible, but <laughs> the shape of my head just looks so much better than up here. My God, I, I, I wouldn't, this guy shows up. I wouldn't let him talk to any of my kids. This guy looks bad. There's, <laughs> that guy look, does, doesn't look right. I'm so glad that I got rid of my visceral fat and I changed my appearance today. And look at my vascular chew, uh, Eric, how much better my, my veins uh, veins have become there from, from better blood flow. So those are the scans I wanted to cover, cover these important topics, visceral fat, uh, heart fat, and then fat in your muscles. So hopefully get your audience educated about them and get intrigued enough about it to hopefully come to you and uh, or me uh, or um, in the future. Um, let's let's you know, let's let's get other doctors trained on visceral fat and health and performance optimization. I hope we can start a residency in health and performance optimization and uh, really transform medicine because we really need to be, um, you know, looking at a whole new approach to healthcare where we truly get patients better instead of making our bank accounts get better. And that's the problem with healthcare today is that we're more concerned about generating revenue for healthcare systems than we are in improving the health of uh, patients and with the exception of you and I today. And we're, we're the exception and, uh, and other physicians to come. Man, that was awesome, Sean. Appreciate that. That was amazing. And I love the images and the pictures and, I might have to borrow some of those from you because a picture is worth a thousand words, like you said, and it kind of hits you emotionally when you look at some of those, you know, it's like, wow, you know, and it really, really sinks at home. Um, yeah, man. And I love it. Uh, so I love it. That was amazing, amazing presentation and tons of information. I think everybody's going to love this. And we'll definitely have to do a part two because I know I've got to do a hard stop here, but uh, uh, yeah, I definitely like to, to go down the treatment route, but hopefully this piques the interest of everyone listening to, reach out to you or me or both and and, and kind of learn a little bit more. I think, um, you know, you and I know both have talked about the dangers of visceral fat, but as you mentioned, it's just as, and I think we've learned more over the number of years of how, like you said, it's not just a physical thing. It's all those inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory processes that affects not just the local tissue, but your entire freaking body. Um, and your pictures are a testament to that. And um, some of those I've never seen, like some, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the changes in the muscle, but it, like you said, seeing like your vasculature, your hair, you know, other of these things, that's, that's freaking awesome. So that was amazing. Yeah. Well, I look forward to coming back and, uh, talking about other, other subjects. We didn't get into the stuff I really wanted to talk to, but we'll do some more. I am really excited to meet another health and performance optimizing position of uh, your, your followers are really fortunate to have you. Uh, leading this and uh, yeah, just bring me back for part two, Eric, and we'll, we'll do some more. We will definitely do it, my man. So before I uh, sign off, tell, uh, tell our listeners where they can find you. If you want to plug your social media pages, your website, et cetera, go right ahead. Yeah. So uh, you can find me on Instagram at uh, D R S E A N O M A R A. That's just at Dr. Sean O'Mara. And I'm saying on Twitter, and also uh, Dr. Sean O'Mara on YouTube. So I have uh, YouTube videos, lots of great content for free that you can go to. And uh, and then I also have a website, just www.drseanomara.com. If you're really interested in working with, with, uh, with me and uh, to optimize your health, I have strategies out there free, but you'll get much better 
results and get there faster. And uh, uh, if you if you come to me, and I don't take everybody because uh, you know there's there's more need out there. But I do look for people that are really motivated because I study this process because I'm trying to figure out the best strategies and uh, train other doctors in it. So uh, yeah, if you're really motivated and interested, check me out on my website. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I look forward to getting you back on here again. All right, Eric. Thank you very much. All right, you're Stay welcome. Safe. All right. Bye.